All right. Welcome, everybody, to the seventh episode of Red Beard Radio. Uh, I'm your host today, uh, Drew Austin. Uh, we're actually going to be without my my co-host, Alana Dickman, today because uh, this is a topic that uh, she said you boys can have it. It's uh, We're going to be digging into NBA Top Shot. We're going to be digging into Dapper Labs. And uh, we have a special guest. We have Michael Levy from Floaty, founder of Floaty here today. And I'm very excited to be digging in uh, to Floaty and their role in what they've been uh, kind of in the flow ecosystem and the Dapper Labs and NBA Top Shot ecosystem and a variety of other things that they've brought to the table. I'm excited to dig in there. Um, and then we're also going to be bringing on Jason Metz, who's going to really help us debate Top Shot. We've had them all on Twitter. We've discussed it all on Twitter. And I'm super excited today to just like finally just talk it out and really talk things through with the three of us. So we're going to have a great conversation today. And uh, yeah, let's kick it off really quickly. Mike, why don't you just introduce yourself so everybody – oh, before I before I kick it off to you, let me first tell everybody to like, subscribe, comment. If there are comments, we will be answering questions in the YouTube. So you know, if there are comments, we'll pop in there. We'll answer them. We'll make sure that we can get back to everybody on the, the question. So feel free to leave comments. Make sure to subscribe. And then also make sure to, ju to join the Red Beard Venture Syndicate because everything we talk about here is all our – all um, many of the are all topics that we invest in categories we invest in through the Angelist Syndicate, um, and you could find out more information below uh, about where to click on the syndicate, where to get to the syndicate, and to subscribe. So, without for, without any more uh, without any more time, let's go right into Mike. Mike, why don't you introduce yourself, buddy? Thanks, Drew. Uh, so first, it's an honor to be one of the uh, two guests for your first solo recording. Um, RBV streaming uh, is, is going to be in great hands with you. I know I know you, you make a, a strong duo before this, but excited to see how you do on your own and think you're going to do a great job. Um, and before we get to Floaty and me, I do want to say I've been a little bit around the RBV ecosystem. Uh, you guys are investors in Floaty. I've participated as an LP in, in one, of, uh, one or two of you guys' funds, and you guys do really impressive and really great work. Um, I think a lot of people talk a lot, but you get your hands dirty in a way that I think a lot more people would benefit from doing. You get really, really involved in diff different parts of the ecosystem, deploying capital, learning, challenging people. And it's really cool to see. I also always enjoy connecting with you and really appreciate you having me on. Uh, and for a little bit of my background, uh, my name is Michael Levy. I'm co-founder and CEO of Floaty. Um, I originally have a kind of finance, traditional banking background, um, did that for uh, a, a number of years before I found crypto in 2017 uh, and more relevant for us, NFTs in 2020. Uh, and in 2020, uh, my, my first foray into NFTs was NBA Top Shot. So I joined the platform in September 2020 in the thick of COVID. Um, and for me, it filled a lot of voids. I'm a huge sports fan. I like collecting. Um, I do a trip to a different MLB stadium every year to collect bobbleheads. Uh, with, with a friend of mine. I do a lot of weird sports fan things like that. Um, I'm also interested in markets in general. And for me, Top Shot, the idea of digital assets around sports, um, especially, was a really cool intersection of a lot of things that I like. Uh, and so I dove pretty deep in right away. Uh, it took me about a week before I bought my first pack. And within, I think, two weeks after that, I had deployed um, an aggressive amount of capital into acquiring what I thought were were pretty cool series one grail moments. And it was an exciting time. There were probably 200 people on the platform at the time. No one knew what was going on. Um, and it was a, a really strong roster of individuals. There was a lot of people that Dapper brought on to beta test their product and a really cool, cool time. Um, you're, you're familiar with it as well, Drew. And Mike, how'd you, wait, how did you first discover it? What was your first, um, what was the discovery moment? So there was, someone put out a tweet on, I think it was September 7th, 2020. And it said, the NBA has released digital collectibles that they're selling and they've sold up to upwards of a million dollars worth of assets at this point. Um, learn more here. And it linked to Top Shot site. So I clicked it and there was actually no way to sign up because it was in their closed beta period. And so I was like, okay, um, fine. Whatever, I'll wait around for this a little bit. Seems kind of weird anyway. And I actually sent it over to a few friends. And the more we talked about it, the more I was like, this makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure it's going to be something that we talk about with Jay um, as part of our conversations. I won't get too much into why I think it makes a lot of sense. But 
I concluded with a couple of friends, I think this is a great concept. And so I wanted to get access to it, to get in. And so I actually ended up DMing the official NBA Top Shot Twitter account, which at the time I think had like 9,000 followers versus today's quarter million or so, uh, and saying, found your site, think it looks kind of cool. Would it be possible to get an invite to the closed beta? And they said, sure. They sent me an email. I clicked it and I was in. And so that, that was it. I think that was September 10th, 2020. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. So, and I'll give you a little, let, let me also add a little context here. So when I, I discovered NBA Top Shot about a month later, so I came in around October and um, I remember vividly. So I'm, you know, again, I'm also a collector. I'm a sports fan. To me, Top Shot made total sense. Um, now, Top Shot wasn't my introduction to NFTs. Um, I started buying NFTs on Super Rare um, in the art marketplace uh, around the end of 2018, early 2019. So I was, I was already looking for things like this. I was um, really excited when I came across NBA Top Shot. It struck a chord with me because of of my passion for collecting, my passion for sports, my passion for crypto. I was, you know, I've gotten to crypto around 2013. So this really struck a chord for me. And I remember vividly, uh, like you were the person in that Discord. And those early Discord days were just like, they were special. There was just so many cool, they were just like, you knew everybody, everyone was talking about everything. We were trading, we were buying, we were flipping. Um, and, you know, you were the first person that really taught me the game of NBA Top Shot, really helped me to get up to speed. Um, you were very active early on like what made you what made you play that role like you know not only did you go in and buy but you became like a shepherd and a vocal leader in the community and you know what drove you to that yeah so it's uh it's a good question um i think early on first again you know, i mentioned before it was the middle of covid and i'm so i'm someone who has a lot of hobbies i like to explore different things i like to try different things i have my own bowling ball. I have my own rock climbing equipment. I've tried every sport you can imagine. I do a lot of hiking. I travel a lot. I keep myself busy. And so when I was stuck indoors during COVID, I, I, I had a lot of time to fill, basically. And generally, when I do something, I don't like to kind of do it halfway. I like to go the whole way. And so I came across this thing. I found, you know, there are 200 people in here. First, I, I will say a big part of it is among the people who I met early on, I think every single person I spent a lot of time with was incredibly helpful to me in terms of um, explaining to me what's going on. What are NFTs? How does blockchain work? What's the flow blockchain? What's CryptoKitties? How did the Dapper Labs team come to be? Um, what's the story with the Top Shot moments? What, like, what's the future here? How does it all work? And people spent hours and hours and hours answering my questions. And so I think there's absolutely an element of kind of paying it forward. People taught me. I'm more than happy to teach other people. Um, and then for me, it, it sort of clicked after, I want to say two weeks spending time on the platform, like, holy crap, this makes so much sense as the next evolution of sports collectibles and sports cards. And I'm just genuinely really, really excited about it. And I like talking about it. I think it's interesting from a market standpoint. We're so, so early here. It's, it's 200 people versus a trading card or sports card audience of, I don't know, hundreds of millions um, or, or around the world, something like that, maybe something in that neighborhood, maybe that's exaggerated, but a big number. This yeah. is really cool to be in at this early stage. And uh, you know, I, I just really enjoy talking to people about it and talking to other passionate people about it who are thinking about it the same way, trying to understand what's the right way to think about this from a player standpoint, from an NFT standpoint. Is Dapper Labs the right horse to back here? I started yeah. learning more about other NFTs. You know, you mentioned Super Rare. My first introduction outside of Top Shot, um, I think was maybe... Uh, like, Oh, oh, actually, I remember it was a friend told me this was a crazy situation that got me even deeper into NFTs. Um, on Friday night at 7 p.m., this guy Beeple is dropping 100 editions of some piece of art for $1 each. If you can get one of those, it'll be great. So I went to my computer at 7 p.m. I was sitting down with my wife at like 6.58. My alarm went off. I went and I happened to be one of the lucky 100 people who got one of these editions. And you immediately they said, yeah, I do still hold it. Yeah. Oh. Um, it started trading for like $5,000, $10,000. And within like, I don't know, three months, it was up to like $100,000. And I was like, this is like all crazy. Um, but anyway, so in answer to your question, I was really, really excited and felt passionate about the platform. And for me, it was a big learning curve. And I wanted to try and play a role in helping other people understand this and figure it out the way that I did. And it brought me a lot of joy. I thought it was awesome. And, you know, when we first connected, you're someone who's, you know, a very interesting person who's really passionate about what you do. And I, I felt that right away. And I was like, yeah, let's, you know, let's talk, let's jam.
Yeah. So let, tell me about that. So you, there was a point from being a collector to being a real investor. You put meaningful capital to work. Um, what was the, was there a moment? Was it gradual to capital deployment? Was there a moment where you're like, you know what, I want to go all in and I'm going to start pushing. And you like made a conscious decision to push the chips in. What was like the first big min, like movement on the investment side that you made? So like, tell me a little bit about, I mean, listen, you're a tradition, you come from a traditional finance background. So, you know, it's not like you're you know, someone who's going to be throwing around money at anything. You're not, a, you know, a complete like degenerate gambler. You're you're someone who's going to really take a thoughtful approach to investing, at least from the experience I've had with you. So like, tell me like what gave you that confidence to say, hey, this is somewhere where I want to put some, I want to, I want to put deploy capital and make an investment. Yeah. So I think it was a combination of a few different things. So when I first came to the platform, I, I was, I definitely approached it with a little bit of caution. I was like, this is kind of sketchy. What is this? Everyone else, you know, among the other 200 people, honestly, a very small portion were sports fans. Most of them were heavy, heavy crypto people and were like crypto kitties people more than sports people. So I was like, what is this? And why does everyone want to sell me the moments? And so then I started kind of putting the pieces together. And what I learned was I joined in September, but the platform opened up in June. And since that time in June, you actually couldn't withdraw money from the platform, which continued to be an issue for a few more months. And so what I came in and did was, um, well, actually, I guess before what I actually did. So I started doing more research about Top Shot itself. And I found that one, it has an actual NBA license to, which I wasn't that confident early on. I was like, what is this? Is this a scam? It has an NBA license. And probably most importantly, given my background, was that it was backed by um, Andreessen Horowitz, I think Samsung Ventures at the time, Google Ventures, and they had backing from some of the, you know, the best investors in the world. And for me, that is better than any sort of diligence I can do on my own. These are people who have seen every card available to outside investors, and they've concluded this is a good horse to back. And so I'm looking at it. They have extremely serious investors behind them. I personally enjoy the collectible. I think it's cool. I think it makes sense. Again, I think we'll get to it later in, in, the, in the stream, but it's, it's a better version of sports cards. To, to me, um, they have an official NBA license. Um, and there are literally 200 people here collecting these things. If this even slightly works, um, and like you know, we double the user base to 400, there is some serious, serious capital appreciation potential here. Um, and the supply is pretty constrained in Series 1. And I'm sure Jay will have views on that, but there just is not a lot of supply. I'm looking at like LeBron James's Top Shot debut, um, and there's 1,000 of them. It's just a tiny, tiny, tiny number. And I'm looking at it, and it's like, you know, cost between 20 and $50 to buy some of them at this time. And so I, I, I bought a few and I felt like it was just an asymmetric bet where if this works, we could be looking at like massive, massive, massive multiples. If it doesn't, you know, it's, it's a write-off, but to me, it's, I don't know, something around a 50, 50 bet with a huge, huge payoff. And so that's kind of how I thought about it. Makes total sense. Okay. So now let's fast forward a little bit. So you're collecting, you become one of the, you know, top, two top three top five collectors in the entire ecosystem uh, are you still in that in that top five yeah so there's there's really like a top two, there's a top three one of them is whale vault which is kind of a, yeah. a syndicate that doesn't really touch its assets and there's complicated legal situations my, my latest understanding is they actually couldn't sell assets if, even if they wanted to that they're trying to understand the legal ramifications oh, wow. of know, selling individual I nfts yeah so, so their account's big i, th I think it remains um, bigger than mine. And then Alexo or Alexo is really those. Um, Alexo and <laughs> myself are, are kind of the top two of individually owned accounts. And then there's like a, a, a swath of people underneath that, including Steve Veerman, um, Liberary, and I think Greek Freak is still up there and a few others. But in answer to your question, like, yes, I remain one of the, the largest holders. Okay. So when you went from that transition to actually saying, hey, um, this ecosystem, Flow, Dapper, there needs to be uh, more development. And you were going to decide to go hands-on and build what is now Floaty. Can you talk a little bit about the that journey, that that journey and what inspired you, what what drove you to, to make those decisions? Yeah, uh, so there are, I would say there are two things. So first one is, is just kind of um, putting two things together for me. So again, I come from a finance space and in finance world, every single asset class is heavily, heavily financialized. And so whether it's 
real estate with mortgages and leases, whether it's collectibles that you can borrow against, whether it's fractional ownership of collectibles through things like uh, Rally and Collectible is another platform. Um, there are tons and tons and tons of ways to financialize assets in every single asset class. And so my general view was, and this was pretty early at the time still, NFTs will become mainstream assets. They make a lot of sense. Um, today, they lack the financial infrastructure that exists in so many other industries. I think that will be a need. And so I want to get ahead of that and fill that void myself, basically. Uh, I'm really passionate about the space. I can put my professional experience together with uh, my, my newfound passion about this collectible and put together a platform. So that was kind of the general concept that I started thinking about pretty early on. And then what really was the final catalyst was the sorts of transactions that we now support on Floaty, which we'll talk about, um, were happening already on a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer trust basis. So we initially launched as a peer-to-peer -peer loan platform, allowing people to take out loans using their top shot moments as collateral. And so imagine a pawn shop, you go in, you carry your, your TV, a watch, a gold coin, whatever it is. And the pawn shop says, I'll, I'll give you a loan for 20% of the value of your um, asset. And if you don't return this loan with interest, I'm going to keep um, whatever you've pawned here, the item you've pawned. That's effectively the, the value prop that we offer to individuals. You own a top shot moment, you can go and say, I want to borrow a certain amount of money against it. I'll repay um, interest on top of that loaned amount. And if I don't repay, you get my underlying NFT. And so that sort of transact, uh, transaction was actually happening through Discord, basically, uh, where people would say, hey, I actually want to borrow $2,000. Um, you don't know who I am. I'm an anonymous person on the internet. I'll send you this Top Shot NFT now. It's worth $5,000. Send me $2,000. If I don't pay you back $2,200 in a month from now, you can keep the NFT. And th there are so many problems with that. It's trust-based. Um, if someone is malicious, the, you know, if the lender is malicious, there's pro it's problematic there. Um, there's a lot of problems with that. And so we basically decided to formalize it with Floaty. And, and so kind of those were the two big things that push me to actually go forward with this. Okay, so tell us about um, tell us about Floaty and then tell us about, um, you know, what have been, I guess I got, a, I got two, two questions here. One, tell us about Floaty and like, what are the, what, what are some of the um, core capabilities, but also what are the, you know, what are the, the value propositions to the consumer and, you know, what is the, the big vision for Floaty? And then my, my second part of the question is I want to kind of understand your relationship to Flow and what are your thoughts on Flow? So like, let's start with Floaty though. Tell us about Floaty, like the core value props, but also, and, and like, you know, where do you see Floaty going? What's the big vision, the big dream? Yeah, so, so Floaty itself, I would say the mission statement is to try and address pain points in the Flow blockchain ecosystem and to try to propel the ecosystem forward from a Web3 perspective. And so that's a big word salad of, uh, of basically we try and be very receptive to our users and to the platforms we support and the types of transactions that people want to do but can't do in a trusted way. And so... Uh, I mentioned earlier, but the, the transaction type that we launched with was peer-to-peer -peer loans. Uh, and so basically, again, imagine a pawn shop, but for NFTs. Um, then soon after that, we launched NFT rentals. And the purpose of that is some NFTs have temporary utility attached to them. Uh, and so imagine you get a band's NFT and they have concerts and one's in LA and you live in New York. And so you don't want to sell the NFT, but you have access to these tickets that you can't use. You can rent it out to a friend or more relatable for the Top Shot audience, you're doing a challenge. You have five of the six requisite NFTs and you don't wanna buy the sixth NFT, but you wanna complete the challenge. You can rent that sixth NFT. And on the other side of that token is someone who owns a large stack of that type of NFT or has one of the six components and doesn't wanna complete the challenge, but wants to monetize their NFT. So that was another pain point that existed for people um, that we tried to address with rentals. And then the third feature that we have is a traditional secondary buy-sell marketplace. Uh, so overall, we have loans, we have rentals, and we have um, purchases and sales as an option. And um, you know, really what we're trying to accomplish is to be a permissionless platform, meaning that if you are a collection and you want support of the types of transactions I'm describing, it's extremely easy to do. We have developer documents that basically say, if you follow these three steps, you will be a, a collection that appears on Floaty. Your collectors can immediately buy and sell 
rent, loan, and do whatever else they want on Floaty. And we're the only platform on Flow that really exists like that. Um, yeah. There, on Flow today, it's very, very manual. All the other platforms where you have to go, the collection has to approach them. You have to chat for a while. You have to describe how it all works. There has to be some manual coding. We've been built from the beginning to be permissionless uh, and to be composable with kind of every NFT. And I think that's really what the, what Flow needs. And yeah. so that, and you know, where we're we, we've built ourselves. Look, Dapper Sports has awesome marketplaces. Really, Top Shot does, NFL All Day does, UFC Strike does, La Liga does. We want to have some of that market share. At least there's things that we can do that Dapper can't do. It's features we have, but we're competing with massive established marketplaces. Really, what our end goal is is to be the go-to marketplace for all the features I described for everything that isn't Dapper Sports that might not have this beautiful, shiny native marketplace. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And gotcha. In, in, in many ways, I would say open sea of flow from that. That's what I was thinking. I, as world. you were talking, I was see, I was thinking to myself, open sea plus the financial inf- the, the financial system. How has it been working with flow? Like, how do you, what do you, what are your, I mean, you, you're as close to flow as anyone I know. So like, you know, what is your perspective on flow now after this time of working with it? So, and I think this is something that we're going to describe, we would talk to Jay about as well. Um, but I would say broadly, I really, really align with Flow's vision for the usage of a blockchain, where a lot of uh, blockchain activity today uh, and, and leadership among uh, NFT world, crypto world, they hold the user to a standard that is just unachievable for potential for a huge majority of potential users here. And it's not mainstream friendly. If you think about the Ethereum experience, uh, most of the L2 experience, realistically, even Solana, which is probably somewhere between Flow and Ethereum, realistically, it's just not geared towards the average mainstream user. And Flow from day one has kept that mainstream user in mind. Um, and there are good parts of that and bad parts of that. Um, the good the good parts of it are that it's it, a safe ecosystem. Dapper Wallet, everyone is KYC. You can use a credit card. It's really, really straightforward and easy. You sign up with an email address, which is fantastic for adoption. And it's uh, really, really easy for Dapper or Flow to go to new IP and say, look, we've done this with the NBA and NFL. It's very, very straightforward. We don't have the kind of hacks and problems that other ecosystems have. Um, but on the other side of that token is it's very, very difficult for builders uh, like Floaty and like other companies or, uh, and platforms around the ecosystem to build in, a, in a, an environment where Dapper and Flow kind of hold all the keys and call all the shots um, versus other blockchain ecosystems where everything is wide open. You know the exact rule set. Um, and, and so Dapper Wallet um, has it's a, it's a walled garden in a sense. And we can talk again about what that means. I don't want to go too deep into it now. Um, but overall, I really uh, agree with Flo's vision of the future of blockchain, normie friendly and mm-hmm. accessible to big IP platforms. Yeah. It comes along with challenges for builders. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last question before we bring we bring in, bring in Jay. Um, I, I always ask this to different uh, to people that are become you know very knowledgeable about a sector and a space. So listen, you've been building in the Web three area. You've been collecting in the Web three space for a while. If you were to put your investor hat on, like let's put you an angel or VC hat on for a minute, what would you be looking for as an investor, and where would you want to deploy capital? Where do you see big opportunity right now as an early stage investor in Web three? Like what 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 like what excites you it could be you know something you've been working close to or something completely that doesn't even exist that you'd love to see so i think the biggest thing i'd be looking for is is a a true moat and i, I know that is kind of cliche among investor universe um, but one of the interesting things about blockchain is that contracts can be copied and so you see pretty frequently that one platform just kind of says the you know the transactions that this second platform does are pretty cool. I'm going to take their contract. I'm going to fork their contract and just put a new kind of front end uh, wrapping over it and then take a bunch of money, throw it at promotions and incentives and tokens and whatever else, and bring a bunch of users in, then go to um, investors and say, look how much volume we have, hopefully raise around. And then at some point, we'll figure out how to make a sustainable business. And for me, as an investor, um, as, as a builder, I don't think that's a particularly sustainable model. The idea of let's throw a bunch of money at the wall um, and get users to come over here and hopefully they stay when the incentives run out. I think we've seen time and time again that users realistically don't stay. 
after the incentives run out. And what ends up happening, especially in this world, um, is yield farmers um, or token farmers come and they kind of hang around as long as the rewards are there, and then they move on to the next reward opportunity. And so the question is, how do you put together a platform that truly has kind of a user moat that is it has people locked in um, such that it's not easy to switch and users genuinely don't want <coughs> to switch? Um, and that can be done at the tech level, um, where one of the things we've done at, at Floaty is we are built ex in an extremely scalable way. Right now, Flow is pretty small. If Flow were to like 50x right now in terms of collections and activity, we would be able to withstand it really easily. Whereas a lot of our competitors have focused more on, um, let's say, like you know, front end things or promotional things. We've been behind the scenes kind of building on that basis, and and that's why um, you know we want to do things that other people can't replicate in a really really easy way. Um, and so the biggest thing for me is is moat. Um, and what that actually looks like is a really hard question. I, 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 I don't envy your um, your position as an investor in many times because of how the blockchain space works, that so many things are easy to replicate, um, that it's it's really hard to get a loyal user. And that because it's digital, it's really easy to switch. Um, it's not hard. You, everything's composable. You just plug your wallet into a new platform. You carry along all your assets with you. And people don't stay. And so we spend a lot of time on Floaty thinking about how can we make our platform um, just so nice to use, so friendly to use, combine different features like rentals, uh, you know, loans and buying in such a way that, that copying one or two of these contracts isn't enough to replicate what we do as an overall package. Um, how can we you know, bring users in as, as VIPs, for example, and build in the right kinds of incentives, which are things that are forthcoming for us to build actual long-term sustainable loyalty. And it's it's a hard thing. That's, that's what we spend a lot of time looking at. And I'm sure it's what you spend a lot of time looking at too. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. No, it's it, there's no doubt about, there's definitely a lot of gaps. There's definitely a lot of opportunity. There is a, it is definitely difficult to build a moat in the space. Um, but listen, we have a, we have, we're, you know, it's almost cliche to say we're in the early days here, but we really are. I mean, like if, if most of these, like you were one of the earlier people in, you know, like, again, I've been, I think I was probably in the first few that were on super rare 2018, 2019. And then NBA top shot was the real big driver of, of the mainstream adoption of NFTs. And you were in the first 200 of those. So like, and that was only what, two years ago now, I think, are we looking at two years about three years, three years, three years. So, I mean, like it, you know, we're not really talking about, uh, a very um, long-term uh, industry here. So there's still a lot of learnings to be had, a lot of development to be had, and and that's what makes this all so exciting. All right, let's bring up let's bring up Jay. Jay, uh, you want to come on up here? God damn, you know how hard it is to follow Michael Levy? <laughs> this shit's not fair. Get out of here, Jay. What's going You're on? like one of the smartest, most thoughtful, <laughs> most well-spoken people, not just in this space, but anywhere man this this sucks. Oh, man. well oh, but thankfully i'm actually following drew so it's not as bad yeah. <laughs> where the shots are fired right out of the gate um all right well jay welcome buddy jay let's but before we even get, get into the start to, to, to debate like the the nba top shot and what we all think about it let's introduce your journey a little bit and what um you know what's been your experience on the platform yeah, well, I mean, I can introduce myself. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm Jason. Um, I'm, I'm a marketing strategist. I'm a brand builder. I've spent the last 20 years um, driving growth for some of the largest uh, marketing agencies and brands in the world. I've worked with companies like Procter & Gamble and Porsche and Anheuser-Busch and Johnson & Johnson and ESPN, dozens more. Um, I got into NFTs two and a half years ago, thanks to Roham and NBA Top Shot. I'd never heard of blockchain before. I'm not a tech guy. I'm, I'm never an early adopter in any uh, kind of new technology, but as soon as Top Shot started going mainstream back in February of 2021, you know, I read the stories, I saw the numbers. Um, I'm a huge basketball fan. You know, basketball is my biggest passion in life. It always has been. Um, and, you know, I got involved initially as a collector. Um, the first person I ever spoke to in the world of, of NFTs was Roham. Um, you know, maybe a couple of weeks after I joined the platform, I started, you know, digging around and, and I had questions and you know, from my background uh, as, as a marketing guy, as a brand guy, as a storyteller, um, I saw opportunities. I saw gaps. Um, he had just brought over Dave from the NFL. Uh, so I reached out to Dave, um, who I had not known before. And I said, hey, I, I need to talk to this guy. And he set it up. And we had our first of dozens, if not hundreds of conversations. And I, I became really 
um, fascinated by by blockchain and, and by the opportunity to use this emerging technology to essentially begin to transform the relationship that people have with their favorite brands or celebrities or IP holders. That's the world I come from. Um, and then shortly thereafter, maybe a few months later, I made a career switch and I, I got into Web3. Um, initially, I, I was the head of IP acquisition for NFT Genius, which I regret, but <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, and then I, I left them and I, I began consulting for upwards of a dozen different Web3 projects uh, across all blockchains, um, as well as some Web2 brands, uh, including your buddies over at Fan Controlled for several months. Um, and then I spent about a year and a half as the senior Web3 strategist. A lot of people don't know this because I kept my personal and professional lives uh, fairly separate, but um, I was helping to lead strategy for time, time pieces, um, which is one of the more uh, renowned uh, mainstream brands in uh, in the Web3 space. and. Uh, more recently, I've uh, I've been leading business development for the largest enterprise Web3 engagement platform where I work with clients like Deloitte and Ernst & Young and PepsiCo and Paramount, helping them um, uh, figure out exactly how to integrate Web3 technology in kind of the future of loyalty marketing, the future of customer engagement. So, you know, long story short, um, you know, I've, I've been very, very much immersed in this space, uh, both as a collector and consumer, as well as um, a strategist uh, and and growth guy for a good couple of years now, uh, and it's it's pretty fascinating. Amazing, amazing. All right, so let's let's get it started. So I think like uh, you know I'm gonna start I'm gonna start by like kind of leading with a question, but also I'm gonna lay out my own kind of perspective, and then uh, I'm gonna pass the mic around, and we'll we'll just kind of hit different topics and and, and go from there. First, I want to talk. I, I think the first broad question is: Has NBA Top Shot been successful to date? is my first kind of like topic and question that I want to discuss. I'm going to just share my perspective on NBA Top Shot and what's what what uh, and how, at a broad level. I'd say there's a few things that that to me um define help me define this answer. One, it, I personally would say the answer is absolutely yes. I think that um a, I think it's been the number one driver of Web3 adoption, the first real um, successful launch of, uh, of a mainstream IP into Web3. Um, so uh, to me, that is the, it is, I have not seen anyone come close yet to actually even replicating Top Shot's impact um, on Web3. So as a, as a passionate advocate of Web3, I think that that NBA Top Shot, as a, as a part of the digital collectible and digi digital art, digital asset revolution, there's a chapter on NBA Top Shot in that book, in that textbook. So that's number one. Number two, um, I think the numbers uh, speak for itself, of course, in terms of sales and revenue and, and traction and performance. I mean, there has not been an NFT project that has even come close to sustaining the level of adoption and level of sales uh, month over month for the past three years now. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are just not many other projects that have been able to deliver that. The third, and this is, you know, this is the other, you know, big component to me. I think that, I think Top Shot had, you know, and, and I also replicate, I also say that it's very similar to what happened in the sports card industry. You know, sports cards went through a, a booming moment, um, a booming moment. Then it took that in the 90s, there was a mass over, overprint and oversupply because of the fact that there was so much adoption. I think Top Shot fell into a very similar trap that almost every other Web3 company did. And, but it's happened in the past outside of Web3 is that the growth is starting, venture capital is flowing in. The gr there's no no near there's no near like end in sight. You see the opportunity in front of you that Web three has so much more room to grow. You start pouring um, growth efforts and you start pouring capital and you print more so more people can be happy. You see you want to get more supply in the hands of the users and ultimately there was a, a downturn. And I think that downturn in the entire market um, really impacted people's experiences with uh, Series two and Series three. And um, I why I would also reinforce that I think it's been successful is I thought in series four they have figured out the recipe to be able to balance the the economy, which is the ability to burn, the ability to uh, reduce supply. They have identified the opportunities to create um, really good collectibles out of moments like the anthology moments and leaning into rookies and things of that nature, and um, and 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 still create a business that can generate meaningful revenue by selling packs um, while rewarding users for participation. So, you know, to me, I think the Top Shot's been incredibly successful, even in a tough market. Um, but I definitely want to pass that mic. Jay, uh, you know, what? how would you answer that question? And, Tell us and, you love Top Shot without telling us you love yeah. Top Shot. But, and Jay, I think there is a little bit of like a context that we have to give is like, 
you know, Mike got into Top Shot in August. I got, or 100%. was it August? I Timing is everything. Timing is, is everything. 100%. Shot in, in October. 100%. You got into Top Shot, I believe, in February, you were saying before? February 21. Yes, sir. Oh, no. That was the first day you got in? I, yeah, like I said, man, I'm, I'm not an early adopter of anything. I always, okay. and the thing with people like me is people, like, those that don't know, don't, February 21st was the official top date. That, that we started. don't find people like me don't find out about anything until you know the yeah the savages <laughs> have already <laughs> taken everything from it anyway let me answer your question, <laughs> answer your question. um huge success like no, nobody can deny that top shot unintentionally largely right because it was only ever supposed to be a proof of concept from everything mm -hmm. i've been told but huge success and and more importantly dapper was hugely successful um, nobody can question that Top Shot was and, and remains the first mainstream use case for NFTs. They paved the way for hundreds of big major brands and IP holders to follow. And as you rightfully said, it's still going. I don't I don't know if we could say it's still going strong. The community is is small and, and getting smaller by the day, but it's mighty. Um, mm -hmm. They they created a whole new use case for this technology. They created a quasi proof point for for how the blockchain could at least theoretically be used. And they very successfully tapped into the mindset of the, the pathetic degenerate gambler like myself, who especially during COVID was just desperately looking for something uh, to do with themselves, to invest in, to gamble on. And this is an incredibly successful gambling product. Um, also huge failure um, through, through sheer ineptitude, false promises, hubris, um, they've cost thousands, maybe tens of thousands of NBA fans, millions, tens of millions of dollars in money. Um, you never want to, uh, to lure people into false hope and false promises and through your own actions, cost them money and create a divide with their single most important passion in their lives. And, and NBA Top Shot is, is unequivocally responsible for people losing a lot of money uh, through, through a, a bunch of things that I'm sure we'll get into. Um, I think part of it is they they very much lost track of the task at hand. They were building a brand, or at least they were building a company, and then they foolishly took their eye off the ball. They started investing in additional IP that nobody was asking for, that nobody wanted. They hired the wrong people, which Roham himself would uh, would be the first to say. Horrible communications that alienated uh, the community and the customers that they had. Absolutely reckless handling of supply and demand and, and the marketplace that they were uh, building. Um, so I think it's both, you know, I think huge, huge success. There's no question about it. And huge, huge failure. I think uh, in many ways they've, they've screwed up, you know, the, the most sure thing um, that, that has ever existed in, in NFTs. Mike, what do you got? Uh, so first appreciate both of your guys' response <laughs> and, 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 and Jay, an official welcome to, to, to the chat. And thank you for your kind words earlier. You know, I'm a fan of yours and everything you bring to the table. And we've had some great conversations um, over the years. Um, I'll keep my answer pretty short because I talked a lot before and want to give Jay most of the time here. Um, but I would say in terms of um, purely measuring their success, it's it's a hard question because I just wrote down some notes. There are kind of four levels of this. One of them is the NFT level, broad NFT ecosystem. One of them is the dapper level. One of them is the top shot level. And one of them is the users of top shot level. And so just kind of firing through all of those, um, Drew, you touched on this uh, in terms of Top Shot kind of stewarding the overall space, the overall industry of NFTs, everything that's kind of spawned from there, things from Floaty to different blockchain ecosystems to different NFT projects to Bored Apes to whatever else. A lot of this doesn't exist without Top Shot. So I think <clears throat> undoubtedly uh, Top Shot at, at NFT ecosystem level has been like a smashing success. I don't know what NFTs look like without Top Shot at this point, very different um, is the answer. From Dapper's perspective, I would say also probably really, really, really um, successful. Um, I think really Dapper and the Top Shot perspective, it's important to kind of step back and think when they first formulated this idea, um, back in, I think it was 2019, they started working on this and talking to the NBA about it. What did they really envision this turning into? And I, I can say with some confidence, Dapper probably wasn't sitting in that room thinking we're going to have a seven to ten billion dollar valuation at some point in the next two years from now, or one year from now, whatever it is. And the NBA probably wasn't thinking that NBA players would be running down the court saying NBA top shot this. So I think from that perspective, it was very, very, very successful. And um, I, I think even if you look where we are today, if you took the beginning point, 2019, just general um, 
idea and drew a straight line from there to where we are today, I think it's hard to argue it's not a success. The fact that it's gone up and down and up and down and up and down, or really up and then down for a prolonged period of time is, is you know, definitely something worth considering, but probably taints our view of what's a successful overall outcome for Dapper and Top Shot. You know, the fact that Dapper was able to mark their valuation at seven to ten billion dollars, and now it's I don't know, probably somewhere between five hundred million and a billion dollars, is that a bad outcome for them? Because they dream, they you know, their executives dreamt of one hundred and twenty foot yachts instead of you know fifty foot yachts. Like they you know, they're probably okay. They would probably say this is a successful outcome, and so I think. That perspective probably lands for Dapper and Top Shot, where, yes, where we are today is successful relative to day one. Um, there were times probably where they thought they'd be in a more successful position. Now, um, from a user perspective, mixed bag, exactly what Jay was saying. It, it depends when you arrived, what your view is, what your objectives were on the platform, what your discipline was on the platform. For people who came in um, after what seemed like a gold mine rush, after Bales' article, after... Um, everything that came out, all the media that came out, um, thinking they're going to strike it at rich and it, it didn't go well. That was obviously a terrible, terrible experience. And that's probably damaging, honestly, for the NBA, whose name is behind it, for the individual themselves. I'm sure, honestly, at the personal level, people's relationships were ruined, like families. I, I, a lot of people lost a lot of money. Uh, and on the other side of it, some people who put in a few hundred dollars have discovered a new community they love, um, a new passion they love. People who arrived early on have had a similar ride, honestly, to Dapper and Top Shot, where it's not expecting too much, but this is kind of fun. Holy crap. Good outcome overall, not that different from being in the S&P over the last three years, realistically. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it, it varies by level. Overall, I would say if I had to say uh, one answer, yes, successful with some challenging uh, situations mixed in. So so let, let me, let's talk about the, the, the challenges here. So like, you know, I, you know, both. You of You said guys, challenges. Somewhere, vinyls is spinning a fucking wheel. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> can we curse? Can we curse? Yeah, you can do whatever you want. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so, okay. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges. Um, I, I, you know, I, str I struggle a little bit because a part of me first looks at this and I look back at some of the Top Chef moments and I see on Twitter and everyone says, oh, you know, the Series 2 Common was selling for, you know, $300 and now it's selling for $3. And I look at this and I'm like, you know, you, you people decided to buy a moment of 7,500 supply or 15,000 supply and spend hundreds of dollars on that um, because of the mania that was going on. And the mania of that, that the manufacturer slash seller slash market maker gladly fed into. Of, I mean, of course, like any other business owner in the world, you you know, you don't stop printing Beanie Babies when the mania starts. But the question I don't, what I don't understand is like, what, you know, is it the responsibility of the user to make a judgment call that buying a a, a moment for uh, out of fifteen thousand for ten thousand dollars is a right yeah. decision because of mania, or is it the platform's problem? And like, you well, know, from, from back at this, I'm like, there's, <laughs> there's no way now. I mean, so uh, there, there's a few things there. First of all, buyer beware always with anything. You know, personal responsibility. You you can't sure. blame everybody else for your problems. Like, mm -hmm. get, get get real. That said, for a long time there, Top Shot was pounding their chest about having millions of users, which they knew was not true. Um, I, there was there was one famous time where I can't remember if it was Rohan. I think it was Jacob came out and said, "We're getting ready to onboard a billion users onto Top Shot." And obviously, you know, it, it's all innuendo and, and tough guy talk. Um, but but at some point, the the company has to take some responsibility. Again, they're not just a manufacturer. They're also the sales people. They're also the market and they're also the market maker. So really they have the most vivid view of what their product and platform is. No, nobody else really knows what's going on behind closed doors. And to hear that level of confidence coming from an organization um, that has the license to the NBA, that has these incredible uh, relationships that give them the validation that make these consumers feel like, no, of course we're not being lied to. Of course we're not being taken advantage of. Of course we have to take them at face value. I think a lot of that boastfulness kind of factors into it. And I think when you when you peel back the layers, you you have things like just you know picking one out of a out of a hundred, the nine lives lounge, right? It was like you buy into this particular set of things that we're creating, manufacturing, selling, then you're gonna have exclusive access to the most exclusive club on the internet, the Soho house of all basketball. 
Like when you say things like that to people who otherwise don't know the difference, they're going to buy into the mania. So this is, you know, I guess what I'm getting at is it's not mania that was that was created by the customer themselves. This is a mania that was stoked and provoked by the manufacturer, by the salespeople, by the market makers. And that very much influences the behavior of people. You don't want to be left behind. So if this is what you have access to, this is what you're going to buy. And the final thing I'll say on, on the whole supply thing is, as most people know, my position is this is Top Shot's original sin, right? They, they launch in series one. They launched with a very scarce supply. They put it all into the hands of a few people, Mike and his 199 friends, and they've all made out very well because of it. And then as soon as that article hit from Bales and that, you know, the, the clock struck February of 2021, this massive people joined because you've got Dapper out there saying people are buying digital collectibles for a quarter million dollars, for a half million dollars, but they didn't actually release any of that supply. So it was still super, super scarce. And people didn't know the difference. This was what was available. You're telling me this is the value of these items. The market is paying this for this uh, this stuff. That's why people, you know, ultimately thought that was what the market entailed. They didn't realize that literally three years later, this company was still going to be putting out supply from Series One, right? So all of these factors go into it. It's not. It's not a simple. You know, are people stupid and crazy for? For buying things that were overpriced, you, you can't okay, kind so of position just, it that way. Let me just like so. Let me just counter this for a quick second, though. So the 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 argument here is that well, for a couple things. One, I would say first of all, in a world where everything is on chain, there is responsibility to the user to understand the, the a user the, that literally at that time didn't even know what a chain was. We already said literally this company brought the first product yeah. ever to market yeah. on a blockchain. What the fuck is a blockchain? But it's, Nobody but we even have, knew. But we do have to say that the data was out there where in the, in the traditional card world, there's zero data. There is zero transparency. So the comparable is this is far more visible and far more transparent than anything we've ever seen before in the collectible space. So I think that that's sure. one thing that I find to be really, you know, uh, uh, needs to be said. The second component, which I find to be really interesting is that, you know, in a world where I think that NBA Top Shot and Dapper Labs, of all the NFT projects, and I'm in probably, you know, God knows, I probably bought something of all of them. Um, they have been responsible. They are not the pound, they have not been the pound your chest, this is going to go up company. Every other That's NFT not project, true. That's not other, true. I mean, I, so I can't I was, let you say that. Rohan literally but, used to say things like, this Top Shot moment will be a better store of value than that asset. They used to always publish things with rocket emojis. This is going up. This is going up. So you can't. Uh, so, but you I, can't but say I would that. say that the, I would actually say that the the thing that brought people to Top Shot was less Top Shot and it was more the community. It was more the bales. It was more me, like me telling my friends, "Yo, I'm making so much money on Top Shot. You guys got to get in here." I mean, I brought tons of people into Top Shot. I remember February 21st, three of my best friends bought moments and are now down 95. percent They haven't talked but to like, you since. <laughs> but like the reality is, is that it was, I think there was a mania that was created by the community and Top Shot was responding to the excitement. And as a business owner, are you so not supposed to, to, to lean into and market a product that people are excited about? So like, I guess my question, and then, and Mike, I'd be curious your perspective here as well. Like, what would you, if you're in Top Shot and Dapper's position, where the market is going crazy for your product, selling out with lines around the, uh, the internet couldn't handle it. Like they were, you know, it was almost collapsing on themselves because there was so much demand. You know, I'm on the phone with 10 people all trying to say, get online for a path. What would you have done differently? I mean, I don't think they were, they were not. That's an easy one. I, I can answer that real quick and then I'll hand it over to you, Mike, because there, there's a, so many things they could have done differently over the last three years. But in that moment in time, in February, yeah. 2021, Yep. They could have released the supply that they were sitting on as they brought new people into the fold. I had to wait to join Top Shop, right? Like there were all, all these wait lists. <coughs> you, you, you had to wait until uh, like you, I think they, they emailed me at a certain point. I, I joined like a lottery to get access to buy a pack, right? Like it was not easy to actually join the platform and buy packs. Like you had because to get lucky. Because they had to print enough supply. Because there were so supply. many people because they mm -hmm. were exactly, but they were actually sitting on a ton of series one supply at that moment in time that they literally waited three years to get out. So it's not like they didn't have supply to fill the market at that point. They knowingly allowed hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, whatever it is, people to come in one fell swoop without having a proper balance of supply and demand. And they knew factually that very shortly thereafter, they were gonna dump 
a huge amount of supply that had no choice but to depress the values of everything that those people were buying. People coming in at that point didn't know. They didn't know the rules of the game. There were no rules of the game. There's still not rules of the game, let's be honest. So again, buyer beware, sure. But at that moment in time, they could have either stopped people from coming in, done it in a more orderly way, or they could have had a proper response in terms of the massive amounts of supply that would then drop in the next couple of months, which had no choice but to depress the values of everything that those people were purchasing. They, there was no transparency at that moment. There was no responsibility in, in maintaining um, any, any sort of safety net for people coming in. It was absolutely the Wild West, and they fed right into it. Mike, what do you think? I have so many thoughts. I'm going to try and, and pick up yeah. a few of these. I mean, you guys have hit on a lot of topics here. And honestly, great thoughts across the board. Very little of what I'm going to say is I disagree with anything you guys described. So the first thing I'm going to say is, Drew, you mentioned something earlier that I think is something that a lot of people in the community are very, very harsh on Dapper for. And that is kind of you take a moment that was sold in a $10 pack, th three users buy it in the secondary marketplace. It goes up to $300. A user buys it there and then no other users want it until ultimately that user sells it for $7. Mm -hmm. Is that Dapper's fault? And and so you, I, I just look at things in extremes. And so just imagine the entire world of Top Shot was one single pack ever. Mm -hmm. And Dapper sold it for $100 um, and I bought it for $100. And it's just <laughs> one moment. And I sell that moment to Jay for $200, who then sells it to Drew for $500, who then sells it to Alana for $1,000. And Alana wants to sell it. And there's no buyers that exist until someone buys it for $150, which, mind you, is still above Dapper's original pack price. And Dapper, mm -hmm. let's just say, because this is Jay's point now, Dapper hasn't said a thing in the interim, let's say. Is it Dapper's fault that the person who bought it at $1,000 could only sell it for $150 when all they did was publish a piece of content and sell it for a primary price. So mm -hmm. to me, I think that's an important thing to consider. And um, th there are a number of people on Twitter. One of them is my good buddy, this guy, Matt Roth, Kings of Cardio on Twitter. Who Shout out likes, Matt. Yeah, he's the man. <laughs> Love Matt. Love Matt. Uh, always likes to screenshot things that say, look, this user in- He was, one, he was the person I was referring to for. Yeah. Right, bought something for $1,000 and just sold it for $7. Why did Roham do this? And it's like, okay, Roham didn't force his guy to buy it for $1,000. That's crazy. Right, so, so that's tough. But the other side of that token is exactly what Jay said back, which is, okay, Dapper is looking at this in, um, environment where there is a mania. Clearly, prices are suddenly 100 times what they were two months ago. Um, kind of why is this happening? Is this sustainable? And are we bringing people into a scenario that could lead to trouble effectively? So first- But do you, do you, my, my group, my, do you think, yeah. they, do you think they're looking at this as potentially bringing them to trouble or they see only growth ahead? So yes. That would so, be the so most a, ignorant view in the history of corporations. You know, I don't know. I, I'm, I, so I was going to say, I'm overlaying on top of everything here this all looks way easier in hindsight at the time you can you can look there's a club top shot episode sometime in february 2021 where there was something like 50 million dollars of secondary volume on like a tuesday and we're talking about it we're like this is great and we're going around the circle we're like what does this mean and i was like i think we'll see in a hundred million dollar day a week from now and so i don't think it was blindingly obvious that this was all gonna like fall apart at some point i think it seemed like even though it seemed like a lot of users were on Top Shot, realistically, I was tracking this kind of stuff. There were, I don't know, 10,000 users. 10,000 users is half of one NBA arena. Forget about global fans, TV fans, whatever else. To me, it's nothing. And so I'm looking at this like, wow, look at all this momentum. Amazing stories coming out. Uh, New York Times articles, ESPN, everything, uh, all these articles coming out. And yeah, it looks like this is going to kind of go, go up for a long time, which is why I'm sitting there. Uh, like in, in the benefit of hindsight, like a jackass, having invested, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars with a, a, a published article in, in the Wall Street Journal saying that my collection's worth, like, I don't know how many millions of dollars and not selling anything. So like, all, all I can all I can do is basically say that like that Dapper's right. decisions were made on the basis of this is going to keep growing for the foreseeable future. And like, all I can do is look at my own portfolio decisions and say, like, apparently I agreed. I apparently agreed too. I, I agreed. And and so if you look at their decisions with the context of it's really easy to say now that that was a peak, but at the time, what did they actually feel like? What did they think was coming next? Uh, I think what they did was, to Drew's point, the, the kind of business decision of let's roll with this. Let's see yeah. what happens. And if this all works, everyone's going to be like, 
wow, it was awesome that Roham said this is the, the next Soho house of, of, of basketball because it is. I've been able to go to I've, – I've, I've been able to meet LeBron James. I was able to have dinner with Adam Silver. And, like, Roham probably thought that was going to happen at the time. Or, I, I don't know, maybe there's an element of he was, like, puffing out his chest a little bit and kind of hoping to talk it into existence. But at the time, it was like, this is, like, really going to happen. This is going to be a mainstream global phenomenon. Uh, and what should Dapper do to kind of – say what they need to do to give it the best chance of actually manifesting and actually happening. And layered on top of all of this, you guys were both there at the time, are some really complicated things. One of them is the withdrawals of money. Until, I don't know what the date was, um, but until sometime into 2021, you couldn't take money off the platform. And so mm -hmm. I, I don't buy any of the, it was intentional by Dapper. Right. It was something where they were working with their partner circle on trying to make it all happen. It wasn't intentional, but intentional or not, it had the effect of people say, I have all this idle money sitting here in Dapper Balance, this fun monopoly currency. I can either just stare at it. I can buy more moments. And that's it. Those are my only two options. There's, there's literally no other option here. And so naturally... People buy moments. I can tell you if I have $1,000 of Dapper Balance sitting there, I'm way more likely to buy something than if I've withdrawn that and I have to put a credit card down or make a new deposit. It's a, it's, it's the same thing as a casino a chips. Sportsbook. Everyone plays on that. Sportsbook. I never – how it, often do I have if – I, if I have a great day and I make money and my sportsbook balance shows a lot, that shit is not lasting long. <laughs> it's it's exactly it's like, right. So, right so, to, so, so to Jay's point, which I think is reasonable, I do think there were things that Dapper could look at internally. They had the data to see that users didn't necessarily see that said, wow, we can see when someone has Dapper balance, they're way more likely to buy something than someone who has to put in new capital. People can't withdraw money. When we do turn on withdrawals, that will probably have a negative impact on the market. How should we factor that in, if at all? Or maybe our ex explosive growth is going to just make it so that none of this matters. So that's one aspect. The second aspect, you want to... Uh, you know, keep going. Point at you. Go, go, go. Keep going. Uh, the second thing that was weird that was going on at that time was the infrastructure from a tech standpoint failure of the platform. So if, if you guys remember, they kept trying to drop packs and the mm -hmm. site would crash. And yep. our, our CTO at Floaty was actually uh, working with the team at the time. So he was working at OpenSea at the time, but was big, uh, was part of the Top Shot beta and knows the, the team. He's, he's brilliant beyond words. So um, it, it's incredible to talk to him about this stuff. But what he's described is the infrastructure that Topshot had set up was not scalable, was not ready for a 10x of users, for a 100x of users. And so every time they tried to drop a pack, there was absolute disaster. So what they ended up doing was for like a six to eight week period, while growth was explosive, prices were going nuts, Wall Street Journal, ESPN articles, while people couldn't withdraw, there was no new supply available, but not because Dapper was sitting there like scheming like this. That from a technical standpoint, they could not release more supply. But Mike, so that, just... that goes back to the original sin of it all. I mean, you're 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 kind of agreeing with with the the core premise, which is they were greedy. They did not have the infrastructure in place to support this swath of new users coming in, and they knew full well whether it was intentional or otherwise doesn't matter. They knew massive supply was going to come soon. But instead of waiting and, and allowing people to come in bit by bit, which is what they should have done because the infrastructure they couldn't support it. I mean, you said it yourself. You had to you had to wait to enter. There wasn't yeah. there was a beta program. I had to wait to get a pack. Yeah, they, there was an alpha, yeah. there was a beta. I mean, they yeah. did try the demand right. was furious. The demand I don't I don't know if you guys remember this, but demand was the, crazy. The demand was furious. And if yeah. I'm sitting here, I guess like where I'm struggling here is that like if top shot, if I'm sitting here as top shot. I don't know how you are not thinking. And, and by isn't the way, it's a moot point. Like, as, I, I as think as it's, as it's a valid topic, but like, honestly, at this point, like three years later, who cares yeah. what they could have done different or better? Because on here's, I'm kind of curious thing. about it. Like, because here's, because here's yeah. the thing it roots a lot. Most of the negativity that I see are not people that join Top Shot today and say, wow, this is awesome. Correct. I'm joining collecting. It's the people. And you know that, why that is? It's the people that came in on February. It's people well, that came in in February. Nobody's really joining Top Shot today, Drew. So it, it's a it's a kind of false it's, equivalent. It's, a, it's those, but it really is those people that came in in February and March 100%. that are the most bitter. So it's really that 100%. those that group. So yeah. a couple. Okay, let's keep let's let's go on a little bit, really quickly. Yeah. Let's. Wait, can I just make one one, one more uh, quick comment there, yeah, which yeah. is I, I I hear Jay where you're saying it's, it's not good to live in the past, but I think I'm not saying it's not good to live in the past. I'm just saying. What they've done since has been even worse in many ways than what they've done. Originally. Sure, uh, uh, agree, but I do think a lot of it is 
people came here expecting to make money. They didn't make money. They and now called it very... the stock market of the NBA. Yeah, There's yeah. winners and losers. There's oh, been no, no I, winner. I, 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 I get that, but 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 now it's at the point which I I think Drew is maybe going to respond to where you say there's no new users, and I think it's all very interconnected. Because there's so sure. many people that had a negative experience under 100%. every single Top Shot post on Facebook, all Instagram, all Twitter, whatever else it is. It's very very negative, and so it is yeah. kind of important to think that you know what could they have done differently to try and avoid this scenario. If there is a reasonable answer there, and like I just don't and know. I, and, how I, easy and I will tell you, I don't believe that is a reasonable answer. I don't think there's an easy answer because of the fact that I'm an investor in a variety of those early companies. You're talking Super Rare. You're talking Zen Run. You're talking NBA Top Shot. You're talking Sandbox. These are all companies that, when they were taking off, were then tasked and challenged to grow to build for massive adoption. Yeah. Web three, it's all coming. Everyone's coming. Build for scale. And yeah. every single project that I invested in, ultimately that was their biggest stumbling block and had to recover from is that they tried to build for a scale that never came. They had well, to but let, here's the funny thing, Drew. They, they had to let did people go. They had to they, let no oh. it, it, it never really I mean because no, they we, never fulfilled their promises. They never built the uh, stuff so they I said they I, were building. I actually think that web three in general didn't ever have that moment. Well, most it's so hard to compare NBA Top Shot to most of Web3 because NBA Top Shot was started by real entrepreneurs, brilliant people with an incredible partner and license from the NBA. Most Web3 projects are fucking schmucks in their basement. Like you can't compare like the NBA Top Shot had a chance, right? And they did bring the masses. In theory, hundreds of thousands of people everybody in NFTs was on NBA Top Shot, right? Like the entirety of this entire ecosystem, every founder we know, every project lead, every community manager, they all started an NBA Top Shot. But the problem is they came out with all these boastful promises. They were building hard court, which is going to be the biggest, best basketball game. They never did a lot of the things that they said they were going to do. Perfect transition. I was just about to ask, are you guys on the side of gamification or collectability? Well, I, we know I, where Mike I, I have a feeling where Mike is. I know where I am. Jay, where are you? It's a tough question um, because I think they, they would have been better off originally had they just kept it to something that could become a collectible. Uh, because when I joined, I thought that's what it was. I thought I was investing in the stock market of the NBA. I was making my bets on the NBA players that I knew and loved and thought were going to have promising careers, mostly younger guys. And I thought that these were assets that could appreciate. And as soon as they went the gamification route, I think the platform and the product became something completely different. And the economy became something completely different because now all of a sudden Dapper had their hands on the scales and they dictated what was going to be worth money from day to day, from week to week, from month to month. And, and the decision around how to invest in this stuff completely, completely changed. Yeah. I think some of the gamification is fun. Um, and I think as, as a basketball lover who found myself in the midst of this basketball community, married, I've got a home, I've got responsibilities, I've got a career, I've got cats, I've got whatever else. Like it became something that I could like check out of my day-to-day -day life and get immersed in, especially when they were doing those flash challenges and it was fun and I was messing around with, with everybody in the community. Um, so I think that the gamification piece is fun, but as Mike will so accurately say when I'm done with my rant, um, it's kill the economy um, because there's an opportunity cost to the games that they've introduced to people. And it's like, you have to play the game. And if you don't want to play the game, then you're automatically leaving money on the table, regardless of whatever side you're on. And it's completely mm -hmm. skewed the opportunity for this thing, I think, to ever be viewed as an actual collectible or something to invest in. So I think it's it's mucked okay. up the entire uh, you know, uh, thinking so, process so, around what. So, so totally, before I get to Mike, I'll just want to add a couple of thoughts here. One, I think that... Um, I, I'm a I'm a heavy believer in the collectability. I've been asked. I've been I've always consistently said on Twitter. I think this is just a better basketball card. Let's leave it at that. But with that all being said, and this is something that I've that I could say consistently. I've seen from Series Four on, they have done a phenomenal job of listening to the user and identifying opportunities. I believe they've done an amazing job of course correcting, improving the experience, and then figuring out the right way to incorporate gaming at gamification with collectability. And I think that's through the, ch the challenge, the current challenges and the burning of moments and the limit and how it creates less supply and the rewards to get the number one edition or the last edition. To me, I don't have to play the games if I don't want. I, I never was a big game player. 
I didn't I didn't like the gaming. I like the collecting, and I have certain thesis. I have certain things I collect, and that's what I go for with NBA Top Shot to this day. That's what I prioritize and focus on. I like debuts. I like rookies. I like you know I like to collect packs. I like to leave them unopened. I have my certain things that I really love to collect, and then everything else I just have fun with. I'll enjoy in a challenge every once in a while. But I think that they've come um, full circle in seeing that the gaming they they he looked at i mean i spoke to raham about hardcore he's like it just didn't it just didn't work with our ecosystem it wasn't the right strategy so they were so like any other startup they could have no strategy what's the strategy no i mean like i think that when you see when you see that and we can get you know we can get that in a minute but i think you'd see that he learned very quickly it doesn't need to be that much more than we are than than a collectible and the gaming experiments like everything else that happened in series two and three which is what i look at that moment as an experiment they have done a good job course correcting mike what is your thoughts there so i think um first i'd say i think jay captured a lot of my thoughts very eloquently and a lot of this is pretty well documented from my standpoint so i want to be conscious of our time we have remaining here i would say my, the short version of my view is First, me as a person, I really, really enjoy games and like edge seeking and sports betting. And I, I got deep into poker for a long time, all that kind of stuff. And I think that experience is part of why I am so opposed to the gaming that happens on Top Shot, because it's exactly what Jay describes here. It's the games aren't, I don't know, I mean, it, it actually mixed in one comment that I, I would ask, but if, if, if we have time, um, to me, at least the games early on were never fun. People wouldn't play them as a standalone operation. I don't believe, honestly, that anyone would pay an entry fee for the right to play these games. Um, and I, I, I know as someone who's a huge sports fan, that between other options like fantasy, season-long fantasy, DFS, sports betting, watching a, a game, any of these other options, it's really, really hard for someone to argue that flash challenges were more fun than these options, except for the fact that they were profitable. And so the edge seeker in me, I, I was a statistics major at school. It's like, it, it, it's, it's something I enjoy doing, finding a game, identifying inefficiencies of it. The edge seeker finds this game attractive because one, it's funded by the entire ecosystem in the sense that it's new moments that are issued and those newly issued moments just dilute everyone else. And that's where the value comes from, but only 10% of the ecosystem is playing. And so you're basically getting a risk-free way to profit and that is super fun, but it's awful for the people who aren't playing the game. And so for me, that's the basic premise of, I like games as a concept. I'm not against the idea of games. I'm against the idea of games that don't make sense and create an inconsistency between the broad goals of the platform for most users. And so for me, the, the uh, gamification has always been at odds with the collectability. And so then we start talking about things like burn leaderboards, the games in general, even like set challenges and things. And my biggest question, my overarching question, my headline I like, question. I like those. You don't, do, you have a, do you have a problem? They're trash. Yeah. The set challenges are trash. Look at what happened to the most recent run it back set. Like it all has, has plummeted by like over 50% overnight because all of a sudden a year later, those moments are unlocked. Nobody wants to play these games. It's what Mike said. People feel like they have to play. They're not fun games. They're not even games. I don't know why we call them games. They're yeah, like they're things you have to do or you're an idiot. That's what they are. Yes. So my my, my headline question of all of this is is all the uh, the noise, the confusion, the blog posts, the long threads from Twitter, the dedicated individuals on the Dapper team focused on creating these games, which creates additional overhead, which then needs additional packs to sell, which dilutes the value of everyone else. Is all of that worth the positives you're getting out of the games. And my question is, are there any people who are on Top Shot for the games? And I say the games, not the profits that can come from the games. From and what the do you, games you, themselves. What do you call it like, uh, so for me right now, I think the burning, I think burning moments are the most, is the, is the best thing they've done when I do so, Top Shot. So I what, what I don't good. like about that is I think for for some, not from the NFT space, the, your average 45 year old dad with his 12 year old son at Madison Square Garden watching the Knicks uh, eke out a victory over the Hawks. Um, if he, yeah, <laughs> if, he, if, if he wants to come onto Top Shot and just say, I want to buy an RJ Barrett moment, you can't really do that because of all these other things. Is there an ongoing leaderboard competition that's impacting the value of these moments? Is there an unlock period that is about to end that's going to lead to an influx of supply of this RJ Barrett moment? Is there a set challenge that basically means if you open this pack, it is 
financially optimal for you to actually immediately sell this NFT and then buy it back after the challenge is finished because people have only bought it for the purpose of completing the challenge to try and do the plus EV The action. whole system and is just this Frankenstein thing that they've patched together day by day, by week, by month, by year. None of it makes any sense. You even have hardcore users literally on the Discord who live in the Discord every day when any of these new games come out asking for clarification. The fact that die hard top shot junkies don't even understand what's I, happening I in these guys, I, maybe i'm confused or not seeing this but like i'll tell you like since there was a there was a period where i completely agree and i think it was series two series three series four this has been as straightforward as hell there's burn leaderboards there's not. set leaderboards all there's, the implications have to be moment. factored in though but there, yeah, but, 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 but burn leaderboard is confusing because like, it's, it's reliant on top shot score. Top shot score has crazy dynamics. And yeah. for me in my collection, I can have a moment that if someone buys that same moment tomorrow, it's worth one tenth as much in a burn leaderboard. So this person then says, I'm going to participate that, in a burn Isn't that a fair leaderboard. way to approach it? You spent a lot on that moment. You deserve, you deserve to be rewarded. He didn't okay, spend so, a lot on most yeah, of those so moments. There's, yeah, there's two things. So first, <laughs> top, top, shot score, top shot score's biggest issue is that the initial top shot score, when it first was released on whatever date it was, that's called October 2nd, 2021 that locked you into the average sale price at that day so if i bought something for one dollar that had an average sale price of 75 dollars at that moment i got credit as if i paid 75 dollars for it and that is locked now so i didn't pay 75 i do think there are some benefits of them offering bonuses to people who are who are down money but every single layer like this you, you know what it's, you know it's like this is occurring to me for the first time the u.s taxation system each component in isolation probably makes sense. When you put it all together, it's impossible for anyone to actually understand what's going on, which leads to friction, confusion, frustration. And honestly, if anyone in their right mind could opt out of it and, and just say, I'm completely out of this system overall, I would rather just write a check and hope it's right. That's the equivalent of people walking out of the door on top shot. It's just yeah. too much. That's too confusing. You like, let's say there's a burn leaderboard and it says, you know, you're a Knicks fan. RJ Barrett's rookie moment, a one of one moment, and you're a brand new user and you say, holy crap, my son loves RJ Barrett. I'm going to try to get this for him. And you go out and you spend $100,000 buying RJ Barrett moments to build up top shot score to participate in this leaderboard. And then good old Mike comes over and burns two moments from 2020 and jumps you. And now you're sitting with these RJ Barrett moments you don't want because you want to play the leaderboard game. That's a disastrous outcome. It's the bottom line, you. honestly, the burn leaderboard is just a means to win. It's not a game. It's not fun. Nobody actually wants it, except for like a few people who have nothing better to do. It's just a means to win. I think it can be. It's just too confusing. Trying to solve a problem. It's a fantastic model to be able to reduce supply and show that there's an opportunity. But it doesn't actually reduce supply. It doesn't reduce <laughs> Okay, so, so I won the John Morant number one hollow from Roham's collection the other day. Yeah. Okay. Such I view that moment as, as, as let's call it whatever, one of the seven thousand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's, it's great. But to, for me to have won that, I traded yeah. in, let's call it 12 other John Moran moments. I don't know how many it was that are worth <laughs> approximately the same as the John Morant moment I was dropped. And so there's no net reduction in the market cap of available moments. Not even close to the moment that you were dropped, Michael. Yeah, right, right. In fact, in this in this case, <laughs> no in this case, the moments that are taken out of circulation are worth less than the moments that's now brought into circulation. But like if so, you go through, the, yeah, but that was a one-off. That was a one-off situation. No, not really. The only, the only reason them. someone that was a one-off situation where them. you were the only winner, though. There were situations where there are fifty, a hundred. Doesn't matter. That, that's on. That's on the edge. Those are all no, the whole idea about the, the supply. The thing, thing, they're never going to. The only, thing, <laughs> the only okay. reason anyone would participate in the leaderboard is if they think they're getting equivalent value to what they're trading in, which means it's not a net reduction in supply. You might say we're turning 10 moments into two moments, but Who if cares? it's 10, $10 moments turning into two $50 moments, it's not actually a net reduction in supply. It's just moving value. So everything I guess, they do is moving value. I, I, okay, so let let let's go because we don't have too much more time. I want and I would. There's a bunch of other topics I'd love to get Just into. Just cancel your next guest, Drew. They're not going to be yeah. as interesting as we are. You know it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to spend the rest of the time talking about this. Um, what are you most? What do you? What is the? What What are you looking forward to, if anything, for series five and going forward? And are you are you optimistic or are you um, are you? It's it. Do you look at this as like there's a chance of success? There's no chance of success because once DAPL is involved, that's it. Or and if you are a chance of success, what are you excited about? Should I go, Jerry? Or you're gonna go. Go first. We'll go. Okay. Go. Go. All right. So I I remain 
excited because I go back to when I first, first, first found the product, everything about the actual base product itself, taking away all of the layers that are layered on top of it now is pretty awesome. I think it's, it's a really, really good answer to a lot of the things that make physical cards problematic. And it's like every day I see on Twitter, there's someone in Walmart with a scale weighing physical packs. There is fake autographs around. There are things where Topps has pretended that Luka Doncic wore a jersey that they then cut up, but he didn't actually wear it. Or it was numbered 88 so they could have more number patch cards or something like that because eight's a larger number than seven. Things like that. And all of this nonsense is solved by NFTs. And, and then there are enhancements on top of it. It's more shareable. It's globally accessible. Someone in Thailand can buy. It's, it, it all makes so, so much sense. And that is still the case today. And Absolutely. you can layer so many interesting things on top of it. It's like the best way for if I'm an NBA owner and I want to try and say, who are my actual fans? You can't look at like season ticket holders because a lot of those are just like flippers. You can't look at like who owns sports cards because there's no record of that. There's, it's not trackable. Mm -hmm. The best thing you can do, honestly, is look at Top Shot and blockchain, a full record of it, who owns like the most mix moments or something like that. And I think we're a far way away from that being like defined enough for uh, James Dolan to walk into Roham and say, like, who's my biggest Knicks fan? But the technology can be used for that. And so for me, that all makes a ton of sense. And so I remain bullish on it from that perspective. What I'm looking forward to is the stupidest little thing happened like three months ago that is what i've been begging for and i think is a positive going forward which was the ability to pin three moments at the top of your collection That's to me <laughs> to me three years after top shot came out it's honestly not holding back truly pathetic that you can't order your your collection i can't say i want to put my rj barrett on one page my LeBron James on another page, my Steph Curry on another page. And I want it when someone visits my profile that they can say, okay, visit the overall binder, look at the shoebox collection, hide my crap moments, whatever else, lock this this moment so I don't actually sell it, but it can be unlocked again those, tomorrow. You don't think those showcases do any of give you any of that kind of uh, experience? Not, not, not really, no. Um, I, I think they can do a much, much, much better job with that. And right now it's, it seems like it's been like the tertiary focus after like gambling games realistically. And like I, I don't know where else they're, they're spending their well their time. number one focus was ip acquisition beyond. sure so ip acquisition. so just like the idea of like okay when you talk to someone about top shot and the 95 percent of the time the pushback is it look what do you show someone how do you carry it around there's no physical equipment i have like the, like here a card this is cool when someone comes oh, into my office the, the mobile app is i think the mobile app is stunning it, it is, it is, but like there are more things you can do with that. Like Veerman put up a video, I don't know if you saw that yesterday, where it showed a whole pack opening experience on an infinite object, for example. Yep. Yeah, That's wow. cool. But like th there's so much that can be done and it's just not done. Um, and so I think I, I, if they just like spent, spent resources, basically if it was up to me, remove the gamification people that work on the platform, replace them with how do we make this aesthetic from a display standpoint, from a profile standpoint, how do we make it so you can flex your cool moments so you can showcase your collection better, focus on that, drop the gambling stuff for the most part, which has been dropped for the most part, I'll, I'll acknowledge. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah. to me, that, that would lead to a, a much better outcome. So I'm excited about that. Um, and yeah, yeah and, I'll, and, I'll, and one thing, I, one thing I want to add to that, I also think that like they, I think that they've done a really good job of improving the moment experiences. Like the mm -hmm. actual the anthology moments are incredible. I think the I think the leaning into rookie. I love the badges. Like I collect moments for badges personally. Like I really like debuts. I love the rookie badges. Like I really I find these things to be. They're doing a really good job leaning into some of the things that are going to help future collectors who've come from the sports card industry navigate and 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 like identify things they want to buy because they're used to buying the first, the debuts, the rookies, things of that nature. So a, I think they've done a great job on figuring out how to curate moments. Whoever did that role, I think they brought someone on recently to do that. I think they've done a fantastic fantastic job. I think the other component that I that I personally am really excited about, A, I think Wemby Mania is going to be big. I think Wemby is going to be a, a huge um, a huge driver of these new, um, of new interest, of new demand, of excitement. I really hope they do well by the Wemby moments. I think they've done really great work around the rookies. I also like supply right now. I think the supply counts are on, are, are really hitting the right numbers. I think they've hit the like the what was it? I think the rare rookies were th out of three ninety nine. If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. 
I think that was a really solid number. I think the legendaries are what in now out of 79, if I'm not mistaken, 75. Uh, it varies 99, 79, depends on the one, 86. Yeah, between 50 to 100, I think, is where the legendaries are going. Also, really nice numbers. And I think commons, the 4,000 is really the sweet spot, in my opinion, my personal opinion. I also love that they're not doing any – that there's one rare, one legendary, one common for each player now in every series. So I think they've done a really good job of leaning into, hey, we're going to make sure that we are – more thoughtful around supply. We're going to be more transparent around supply. We're doing where they're there. Even if there is overpacked demand, they are not creating more of what they've said they're not going to do, which is like, I didn't love when they had six commons or three rookies or two rares. I didn't love that stuff. I want it to be, I'm all about the collectability and I want to get the rookie. You know what I, I mean? Think, so, Drew, I think, yeah. I think you're too stuck in the weeds. I think everything you're saying may very well be true. I think it's largely irrelevant in terms of whether this it's platform supply succeeds or not. Doesn't, doesn't yeah, supply whether it's 399 or 499 or 299 or 999. I think I think for this it's product big difference between 399 and 999 for real. Yeah, I mean but but who cares? Like the, the reality of it is as as supply has gone down over the last couple of years, so too has the the number of users, right? And it continues to go down. In in spite of However, however much they chop their sets or chop their supply, the user count continues to go down uh, accordingly. So I think the, the bigger challenge for, for Dapper or for whomever ultimately owns Top Shot, I don't think it's going to be Dapper. I don't think Dapper is going to be the company that brings NBA Top Shot um, to, to a larger scale. I just don't think they have it in them to build a, a global brand. Whoever runs the company has to once and for all define what is NBA Top Shot. You know, for a while there it was the stock market of the NBA. And then and then it went to um, it's the future of fandom. And I think that, that that's the part that that I think needs the most attention. Is it an experience platform? Is it in fact an experience platform? They need to define what does it mean to be an owner of these assets? Because if that's the thing that they're bringing to market that has never been done before, which is what I bought into, that's where I think the blockchain is a truly transformational um, piece of technology. You can identify who the biggest Knicks fans are, who are the pathetic people who are going to have their heart broken more than anybody else this year. And let's reward them for being loyal Knicks fans, despite how foolish that may seem so to everybody to else. To, to, to talk to that really quickly, because this is actually one yeah. of the things I'm most excited about is yeah. they um, they tested out last uh, at the end of this past season, geo-targeted pack drops. Yeah. yeah. I think that is going to be, an, like I know for myself, I'm not a huge ticket collector. I don't know if you guys are ticket collectors, but I've never been a big ticket collector. Yeah. But when I went to Summer it's League, Ravel territory. Yeah, it's Ravel territory. Mike, you remember when we went when we were at Summer League in Vegas? I was so excited to buy a moment from the game that we were at. 100. percent That's if they I, I, if and when they tap into that, it changes to, everything. So, but, but that's part of it. That's part of it. I, I I've argued for a long time. Obviously, like any any schmuck knows this. They need to be in arenas. They need to capture people in the moment that matters most. They're watching their team play. An amazing thing happens on the court in that moment. Before they leave the arena, they get to scan a QR code and have a, a memory, a, a moment of of what just happened in, in front of their area. Like, yes, of course, like that that is crucial to, to how and, and why this platform scales. But the second piece of it is they have to define what the platform experience is. What does the future of fandom mean? What does it mean to own these moments? Why do they have to be on the blockchain? Because if they're not answering that question, then it's all for naught. So I think, I think floaty, there's a lot of interesting floaty, um, like floaty existing is a fantastic definition of why it's on the blockchain. Honestly, like I, I never oh, really for people who want to borrow or loan. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It, it, it actually showed me like when I've used, I, cause I've used floaty quite a bit. I, it actually showed me some of the blockchain benefits and leaving me outside. It was my really only use case I've ever had for top shot to leave the walled garden was floaty. And, yeah. um, that was a. I thought that was a really interesting opportunity to be able to think, to be able to use the financial infrastructure of DeFi and uh, and Web three and crypto with my moments. I that and was maybe one percent of all future users will ever find value in that. That's so it's got to be more. So I th I, th I think this is I think this is kind of like the culmination of the whole discussion. It's who is a top shot user? Is it someone who likes um, gambling? Is it someone mm -hmm. who wants to squeeze out EV? Is it mm -hmm. someone who is a general NFT ecosystem participant who wants to just add it to their portfolio of, of board apes, creeps, and, mm -hmm. and whatever else is available? Or is it like a basketball fan who is an in-arena basketball fan? And and for me, I think this this kind of 
is, is, a, is a really nice way to summarize everything. This is why I'm not like massively opposed to burn leaderboard, but I think a burn leaderboard, the type of user that attracts is kind of like a, a, a gambler, someone who likes to like figure things out and solve problems and decide whether or not to participate in a burn leaderboard rather than someone who just says, I went to a basketball game. I want to like have a collectible from that game. It could and be, thought, it could be both, right? It, like, there are people that send their It can be both, but you go to Top Shot's website and it, it, it's burn leaderboard, like play this game, challenge here, whatever. And like I've, I've, I've talked to Rohan extensively as it's, uh, you guys have as well. One of my primary things to him is like, you go to the Top Shot site and it looks more like a casino's website than a sports collectibles website. And like, that's naturally going to attract a certain type of user. And so it's exactly, I think Jay is putting it really well. You have to define what does it mean to own a top shot moment? Does it mean you appreciate NBA history and NBA collectible? Is, it, is the overlap, if you're looking at Venn diagram, do you want a greater circle overlap with general gamblers, NFT people, basketball fans? And I don't yeah. think being in the middle leads to a good outcome. And they're I, trying I, to be in the middle. I find, and I, well, it's funny because I, when you're saying this, I find myself to be one of those people in the middle. But that's, I, just, that's a really I, small I, universe of people. I, when I buy moments, I think too, like my thesis in collecting NBA Top Shot and why I didn't sell everything at the top when, 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 and the reason why I kept going even through the downturns is I have, I have two boys, four and two years old. Uh, my thesis is that when they are 10 years old, um, this NBA Top Shot will be around year 10 as well. So it'll be about the same time. There will be no other digital NFT sports card collectible that has the history of 10 years by that point. No, no, it won't exist, obviously, because Top Shot's the only one. So I, my thesis is that I already see my kids getting very digitally savvy, far more than we were when we were young. I can't fathom that my kids at 10 years old are going to have a binder of basketball cards uh, and, and go to their friend's house like I used to do to trade cards. I think they're going to be bringing their mobile phone. They're going to show their friends their collection. They're going to be trading, buying, selling. But why? why? Why is this one thing going to be something in eight years? What about this specific asset that, makes you think that well, that, that's why I'm Because like my kids are already being trained to watch, wear Knicks jerseys and watch basketball games. But if and you think about how much heartache they're going to have in the next I, 10 years wearing those Knicks jerseys. Well, I'm sorry. I think, I th Oh, I was going to say, I, I think I, I agree with I agree with your point here, Drew. Like this generation is is very accustomed to paying like real, real money for digital assets. But everything is going to be digital in ten years. This is going to be one of a billion digital options. For them. But I think I think they're really, really, really far ahead from that. So I don't world, think it's yeah, easy to replicate. Collectibles yeah. because they have videos. What are they no, far no, ahead? No, the understand. whole platform. The whole platform is. is yeah, is but hold on, hold on. Ahead. It's an e-commerce platform where you can buy stuff and sell stuff. Yeah, but the world of collectibles appreciate with time. Every one of every collectible in every single sector. Everything that anybody's ever made in any genre appreciates over time. That doesn't even so make any sense. So my, so my point is, in six, seven years from now, when this is up to year 10, and it's the yeah. only sports card collectible with 10 years of history behind it. With, the, with LeBron's, with John Morant rookies, Who with cares? Zion rookies. That, that's not a guaranteed success. I, I do, Oh, no, no, no. I, my part of my thesis is that is going to play a major role as more adoption comes over time. If they continue to grow over time, people are going to be looking for historical moments. Same reason why I bought a Michael Jordan rookie. You know, I wanted the, the things from years, years ago. People are these kids who grew up watching LeBron. And the but if the NBA gives their license to somebody else in two years, and all of a sudden now they have eight years of experience, eight, who cares? I'm, I'm somewhere NBA. in between you guys. I, I think digital is like inevitable. Yeah, very, absolutely. Very, 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 of course, it's inevitable. I've spoken to people at the NBA. They are thrilled about Top Shot. So like, I've spoken to people at the NBA. They are not thrilled about Top oh, Shot. So I've, 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 <laughs> I've spoken to people, like, I don't know. We've had different conversations, but like, yeah. From what from everything that I've heard about, and literally have had a conversation with their team, like they they are very happy and exceedingly happy with the performance of Top Shot as a new revenue stream, as a new way to engage fans, as a new collectible. So, like I, I've heard nothing but positive things from the NBA side. Shocking. So I think I think di digital is digital is inevitable from the NBA's perspective. Even if there's happy, I think to if they're happy to Jay's point, there's no reason for them not to issue a bunch of other licenses that allow people to do this as soon as Dapper is. I don't even know if Dapper has an exclusive. Yes, as remember, soon as, also, Panini Panini has NF basketball NFTs. I yeah, but not, not videos for what that's no. worth. But anyway, no. so I but I think I think Jay's reasonable question is kind of like everything you're saying could be true. Does that mean Top Shot wins in the end? And like from my perspective, like 
I, I enjoy my Top Shot moments. And that's why I, like, I, I try and go to bat for, I like this as a collectible. Everything else here is noise. Um, if you weren't a hardcore basketball fan, would you feel the same way? No, but you you really only need kind of hardcore basketball fans. Like, yeah. Think about when, when you go to like MSG. But it clouds our judgment, I, I, though. It clouds our judgment about how viable like, something we, we, is. We don't – like someone who isn't a hardcore basketball fan has no business owning these things. Right. Yeah, I mean, no one's buying – I mean, think about buying a piece of paper and a cardboard. It, with, uh, being a practical human being that collects cardboard like that is ridiculous. Right. It has no it, use. It, Right, and I, I think there's a sufficient audience of of above a certain level of um, dedication of basketball fan who collects basketball stuff. Whether it's but today, hardware. how many things can a basketball fan buy that brings them closer to their passion around basketball? A, a million. Yeah, yeah, but but to me, this is a better mousetrap, like by far. Better than what? Th than than physical cards, than yeah. autographs, mm -hmm. than. Says who? I, I, I don't know. Says who, though? Says who? I, I say that. I say that. Yeah, and 3,000 other people say that. It's not me too. No, no. no. Well, okay, but now, but now we're, we're conflating how many people are using Top Shot now versus how many people would like the idea of Top Shot. And to me, that's like part of the whole rest of the conversation, which is why aren't people on Top Shot? And, and it's it's a Frankenstein product right now. It's, no, it's no, a, no, that's a, you're, you're discrediting the market in general. NFTs are soured for everybody in every space. I'm telling you, I, I, I see the metrics, I see the numbers. But these are, uh, these by the are, way, these Top are Shot, not NFTs. Top Shot is outperforming, but no, Top Shot is an you NFT. Can't I mean, it is classified as an NFT. Top, Top Shot is outperformed, but no, but, but, Top Shot, but Top Shot is outperformed. Neither does, I mean, every project has, these are just collectibles. Every one of them are all doing, there's some form of speculation. They're not collectibles, though. They're all speculative assets. You can't every, yeah. compare. I'm, I'm, this I'm on Jay's side that. here. Like, friend tech is basically, has, has proven this out. The, the whole NFT world is the NFT itself is just a placeholder for a, a poker chip. Yeah, it's it's just a line of code. It it, it doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with Jay. Where the, the right way to think about this is like probably how's the sports card market doing overall, and and so overlay that with Dapper and any incremental um, reduction in valuation that is attributable to Dapper is either that people are scared of NFTs or that there's all this other like nonsense that's on the platform that's pushing people away. Yeah, I, I do think that we're underestimating the the negativity around NFTs right now. Because I mean, like, I think they're overestimating it. Because no, no, because there was a time where I had friends that don't give a shit even about basketball that were buying Top Shot moments because they were in it because NFTs were blowing up. Like that 100%. was part of this whole. There was a, there was a major push around NFTs, and right now everyone thinks NFTs are going to zero, and Top Shot is grouped into that. No matter whether we like it or not, it is but part of the NFT movement. It's it, it, not. It, it, I mean, I was, it's I mean, really I not. It's in its own little wall, walled garden, as Mike said so eloquently earlier. It's not. You really can't can't compare this product with the license from the NBA and the experience and the safety and the security to anything that's happening on Ethereum. Yeah, it's, it's honestly, it's just a different animal. I, okay. I, think, I think honestly, the people who are saying I don't want to participate in Top Shot, I don't want to buy Top Shot, I, I don't, I don't like it because it's an NFT, are probably not the people who are going to like originally be the intended audience of just like basketball fans. Yeah, as, I, I, they're, they're I, people who like hop around speculative. You things. might be. I think it might be easier to say that if you weren't as like the way I see it is I see this in the gaming market as well. The gaming market, you have a bunch of you have a, a billion gamers that are resisting coming playing games that are web3 or don't inter or are saying I don't want my game to go to web3 because they have nfts and nfts are bad and when those people come because they will gaming will drive that next wave of adoption to web3 and then you, when you get that when you steal a car in grand theft auto and all of a sudden you could sell that car for $10,000 because it was a rare a rare car in that game and you now have $10,000 in crypto on your platform and then you go look around the space and be like, where can I spend this? And there are certain projects that have stood the test of time. I believe that next wave will welcome top, will be welcomed and be passed to top shot. We That's know my you answer. do. So, so, yeah. <laughs> so with that said, but that, with that said, do. yeah, with that said though, that's because of NFT adoption. That's a big piece of this puzzle. You're not coming, you know, like without that NFT adoption. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Because what you're talking about is kind of funny money, right? And that's how Top Shot started. It was all based on funny money. It was based on people who had these gains from, from these things that blew up overnight and they put it into this thing because it was one of many things that was there. That's not going to be the future. I don't think that's how Top Shot scales. I think it scales by selling itself to basketball fans. And again, that becomes a matter of defining what is the experience that they're giving to basketball fans 
that basketball fans can't get anywhere else. And it's not a better mousetrap. I'm sorry, Mike. I don't think that's how this product wins. People still today in the digital world we live in love having something physical. They love they love being able to see it and show it off and touch it so Jay, and know so Jay, where it came from. I don't think this is a better mousetrap. I think Jay, this is an experience platform, and that's yeah. how Top Shot will win if it ever wins. They have so to define it. In your view, could, could you take away the video highlight and the description and just say, like, just as you have a LeBron James number 2141. That's and what that's it is today. To Nobody watches something? the videos, bro. Nobody cares okay, so, about the videos. So so in, in my view, that's like maybe a use case of, of blockchain. But to me, I, I, I genuinely think it's a better collectible. We may not agree on that, but no. I, I do. I, I do too. Well, wait, wait, wait. To be clear, uh, I actually do think personally it's a better right, – I would not collect means, physical cards. Right. So don't you think that means some people in the world, way more than 2,000 – will view it as a collectible and an increasing percentage of the world because of Drew's point earlier, here, you're here, Drew's point earlier. I do, earlier, but I don't think uh, that's why it wins. That's what I'm saying. I don't so, think that that's why it would win if it wins. I, I mean, I think it's really hard to say, okay, we're going to sell this LeBron James for $1,000 in a legendary pack. And then you need to basically offer enough of a yield on that moment in terms of an experience to justify an $1,000 purchase price. Well, that's Instead, literally how they decided to position their company for at least a year and I a half. I don't think that's sustainable because then, because then the same way I'm comparing gaming to DFS, fantasy, and sports betting, I'm comparing that to basically meet and greet with your friends. At, no, with, not with, a meet and greet. With, it does not have to with, be a meet and greet. It doesn't have it, to be no, cooking. Whatever, whatever it is, just alternative uses of $1,000 to get a sports yeah, experience. I, I, yeah, I don't you can go to the Super Bowl for 5000 bucks. Why would someone buy a Cosmic for $25,000? Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people did, and that's why they were doing it because they thought this was the future of fandom. They thought that but they to were creating nine that's not a sustainable lounge. model. You basically have to say, "I'm I'm taking in a thousand dollars from this LeBron purchase, and I'm outlaying more than a thousand dollars of value. That if I sold it outside of the Top Shot ecosystem, I can get more than a thousand dollars. So by having this whole platform, I'm actually losing money. Yeah. No. No. Okay. You're, no. 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 Wait. 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 One. Mm -hmm. One quick point. You're missing a really, really important point here third parties. So what happens when you have a platform that's predicated on access to incredible data, first and zero party data that people opt into, not only can you sell them stuff, every other company in the world who wants to engage hardcore basketball fans can also now engage them on their terms contextually in a relevant way through a platform that allows for direct communication. That's what unlocks this to be able to provide this promise of experience. That's the future of Top Shot. And I know factually, they had somebody whose entire role was partnerships. The person didn't work out. You know, the practice didn't work out. And I think because of how scatterbrained they are, how much they lack strategy, how much they lack the right people in the right places, they have not adequately pursued this promise of partnerships. That's how this platform ultimately becomes an experienced platform. It's not all going to be one way. It's not all going to be from Dapper or from the NBA. There's going to be you're, third parties that come. Yeah, I see. I like. I very. Di I absolutely disagree on that side of things. You're making it more of like a, a an Amex point system or an airline point system. A I loyalty don't program. A loyalty program. I don't see it as that. I do see it as a as a collectible experience. But okay, real quick, I want to do one last final question. Wish list, big idea, feature. What would what would it be? Feature. Yeah, like, like what's product the product feature? Yeah, like what would be the cool? What would be the one big thing you'd love to see on Top Shot? That would be like that you think would be like a really cool enhancement. Yeah, I think Mike kind of touched on it earlier. Oh, Jesus Christ, I didn't realize how aligned we were on so many of these things. It makes no, for a really great. I agree. Wow, I was makes for send a you a shitty message. debate. Though. I was yeah. going to send you a debate. message after this saying like, nice, like a little handshake emoji. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when I was out in Vegas, um, not this past year, because I refused to go again this year uh, after the clusterfuck that was last year. But when I was out in Vegas last year for what was supposed to be the Top Shot convention and ultimately became... Uh, free chicken wings at at a uh, at a summer league game with Sean. Um, I talked to to Roham specifically about what his strategy was for the platform moving forward, and he very eloquently, as always, kind of went on around how important it was for him to spend you know the upcoming season dedicated to turning the platform from this kind of gambling oasis, uh, this this place that was purely transactional, just a place to buy and sell stuff to a place where you can actually show off the stuff that you own. Um, I maintain that as of today, um, keeping physical cards and memorabilia in a shoebox is actually a better way of showing off what you own than having stuff locked in your Top Shot account. I don't think there's a way to, uh, to, to kind of show off what you own, to be proud of it, uh, to do things with it. I think it's all kind of hidden. 
underneath hundreds or thousands of other things. You don't even know what you have half the time. There is no pride in ownership. There's nothing to do with the stuff other than these weird Frankenstein games. So I think from a feature perspective, figuring out how to transition from this purely transactional, purely monetary, purely gambling focused product into something where people actually can, can admire what they have, can show it off, can do things with it. It doesn't have to be a game. Like I'm not a gamer. If, if, if hardcore existed, I would not be playing it because I have zero interest in playing fucking games. Uh, but figuring out how to better show off and do things with the stuff you own, I think is, is absolutely critical uh, before they go mainstream. Mike, what do you think? I mean, I, I totally agree. Uh, I, th I, th I think from my standpoint, I, I put out a thread, I don't know, a year ago at this point, basically saying that I think something that would be really cool is like a user clubhouse. And uh, someone mentioned that it existed, and I think in like Mad in 2005. But basically, just imagine you sign up for a Top Shot account, and just like digitally, you get like a blank slate of like, initially, it's maybe just like a wall. And you can choose six moments you put up on your wall. And when someone comes to your profile, like that's what they see first. And then they can collect like details and see your shoebox if they want or whatever else. And then once you say that they can measure your progress somehow, let's say you have a hundred total top shot moments that then unlocks a second wall and you get up to a thousand moments. You now have like a house that people can go from room to room to room. And like you, you, you basically give people a way to display this and and however they want. And the, the more you do on the platform, you unlock different customizable way to display and present your collection. And it leads to the right kind of incentives. It's the more you do, the more kind of money you put into it, you get a reward, but the reward isn't profits, which will then attract an, an edge seeking community, a plus EV seeking community. It's m better ways to present your collection. And I think of it along the lines of like, when people play a Call of Duty or Halo or something, they will spend, I kid you not, 200 hours playing this game. So there is a different color skin on their gun or that they have on their name. It says MBL267 with a special symbol at the back of it. People care about this stuff and it's what they take pride on. It is a way to say, like, yes, I am dedicated to this. I am passionate about this. If you come to my platform today, uh, to my profile today, I have like arguably the best collection on, on the platform, unless you know how to put the right filters on and go like cosmic, hollow, series yeah. one, this badge, you would have no idea outside of the three moments I have on the top of my platform. And that's a huge, huge, huge problem. So for me, it would be make a really easy way to present your collection. And, and so if I set, if, if someone says like, you have a top shot collection, what does it look like? And I just send them a link. It takes yeah. them right to this, like, to me, it would be like a house. Maybe it's a binder, whatever you want. It's not my job to figure this stuff out. I'm a numbers guy. I'm not like a, mm -hmm. uh, a marketing or a collection. Or, or Mike, you know, the, the ad there is like, and I know, um, what the hell's his name? Austin is is all about this. Um, just the context around basketball. Like anybody in the future who joins this platform, we're all going to be huge basketball fans. They want or he wants Top Shot to be like the encyclopedia of basketball. But right now, there's no way of even knowing like the context around these moments, why they matter, why they're important. Being able to organize things based on year, based on category, based on play in a visual format. I think that's all part of it. Is like bringing mm -hmm. to fruition this promise of like this is the place that you go to, uh, to to kind of relive your your basketball memories. And if you own part of that memory, then like it means something. Sorry, yeah. I didn't want to cut you off, but I yeah, think that's no, all part I'll say, of it. I'll say like my final thing here I'll, I'll add is like, I'm, I'm also, I'm, I'm a big, like I'm big on life logging. Like I, I'm probably the only person left still checking in on Foursquare, if you will, because it's the way I remember the things I've done and the places I've been. I don't have the best memory. So I'll take the pictures. I'll, I, I, I you know, I use Instagram for my own good. It's like, I use Instagram because it organizes my life into like yeah. memories, moments. And I'm, I use Foursquare. So if people ask me or swarm, Hey, where did you go when you did this? I have this. So to me, I'm very excited about the ability to be able to, um, acquire moments to games that I go and those are the reinvented collectible ticket. I just think that is a really, really like personal, fascinating thing about collecting that it won't be about EV. Like I don't care to sell that. Well, it's I more than EV. It, it's yeah, personal. It's, it's it's personal. Personal. It means something and I, to And you. to me, when you get the, when those things enter the platform and people start to feel that way, they'll start collecting more by that, by, by, because they want to feel more of that. And but you then, know what that is, Drew? It's all, yeah. it goes back to the original thing that we talked about, which is Dapper is the manufacturer, the salesperson, and the market maker. They have created a behavior among this user group that says, this is not something to appreciate. This is not something to have passion on. This is not something to love. It's simply a line of code that you're gambling on. 
And that's why I don't believe that this is the group that's going to take this product to the next level. I think that if you look at who the audience of Web3 users are in general to date, whether it's basketball fans or not, it's been all speculation. It's the only use case that's successful in all of crypto. In every single aspect of crypto, it's the only successful use case so far has been speculation. So I think they had to cater to that customer audience, whatever, you know, for whatever it's worth. But I think that's where they screwed up. I think think the future of this, I think the future is leaning into the collectability. I think we're all saying the same thing here is that like once this becomes more than just speculation and becomes a collectible, I think that's when we're going to see this thing really take off and thrive. Well, I think it has to become an experience. I don't think they can dictate what's collectible and not collectible. I think that time will tell if it's considered to be a collectible, if it earns that. But what they can dictate is, is it an experience that's, that's worthwhile? Sure. All right, guys. Um, I know we're, 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 this is our longest episode to date by far. Wow. Um, so I really, I mean, this is, I haven't even gotten started, man. I know. I know. This is a long time. I'm leaving a whole shit ton of bullets in the chamber. I I do think that we are going to (laughs) bring that. We'll have to do this again during series five. We'll do a check-in. Um, but this was a lot of fun. Mike, always a pleasure. Jay, this was awesome, man. Um, it was just really fun to just like mix it up, talk about something we're all passionate about both positively and negatively. Um, and I, and I look forward to doing this again with you guys. Thank you so much. Where do we follow you guys, everybody real quick? Give me the Twitter handles or where we where you want people to follow you or find more about your 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 musings around uh, NBA Top Shot. Uh, for me, my Twitter handle is mbl two six seven underscore nft. And Jay? Oh, yeah, okay. I hang out Twitter, Discord, email me. Come visit us at at Floaty also. Just simple Floaty io. I'll show that as well. Cool, no doubt. Jay? I really don't need any more followers. If you want to find me, <laughs> ask around. I'm sure you'll figure it out. <laughs> All right. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Great Thank episode. Thank you for hosting. Thank you for hosting. It was a good time. Jay, pleasure as always. See you next week on Redbeard Radio. Thanks, guys. Take care.